These movies honestly fail at almost every level of filmmaking. These movies honestly fail at almost every level of filmmaking. These movies honestly fail at almost every level of filmmaking. What orders from Mordor, my lord? What does the eye command? We have work to do. I couldn't believe some of the things they wrote about uh, the prequels, you know? I mean, but really, beyond, I didn't like it. <laughs> you ruined my childhood, and I'm still angry about the way they treated Jake Lloyd. He was only 10 years old, that boy, and he did exactly what George wanted him to do. Believe me, I understand clunky dialogue. So I almost got hornswoggled in that documentary where I, they weren't calling it the people versus George Lucas at the time, but I could tell from the questions they were asking me, they were, it was an open invitation to trash George. And I have issues with George, but I love that man. I... You go to make a movie and all you do is get criticized and people try to make decisions about what you're going to do before you do it. You know, it's not much fun and you can't experiment. You can't do anything. You have to do it a certain way. I don't like that. I never did. I started out in experimental films and I want to go back to experimental films. But of course, nobody wants to see experimental films. The main thing is to protect these characters. Make sure that they still continue to, to live in the way that you created them. I'm curious that uh, the force doesn't get muddled into a bunch of garbly gook. Can I just say, yes. though, uh, a lot of times I would say to Ryan, we got to think about the fans. Yeah. And he said, no, we got to think about the story and we got to think about our movie. Which I, you know. You know what I found most insulting about all of these comments? Is that you felt you had to ask in the first place. Welcome back to Revenge of the Prequels everyone. You know I wasn't planning on doing this, but I woke up one beautiful summer morning only to get bombarded by dozens of requests to respond to this shit stain. You asked and now you shall receive my beloved audience. However before I begin. A few disclaimers as well as my personal thoughts on Cosmonaut are in order. Firstly, this series is called Revenge of the Prequels. This is not have a nice cup of tea and have a friendly chat about the prequels. This is an inflammatory response series essentially mirroring the attitude of various creators who have wrongfully bashed the prequels in the past, resulting in a domino effect which has led us here unfortunately. Yeah! Hence the word revenge, and this will be a four, possibly five part response series to Cosmonaut Variety Hours video. Secondly, if you personally don't like or even hate the Star Wars prequels, that's perfectly fine. Just note, this is an inflammatory series true, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's meant to offend you. Who it offends depends on the person. When you hear me throw out an insult directed at quote, original trilogy fanboys or fanatics, or Boba Fett pajama wearing ass clowns for example, I try to make it very clear that these insults are directed at a very small minority of toxic fanatical fans. Unlike many creators who insult the Star Wars community in their Star Wars videos and label them as toxic, unpleasable or idiotic fans without distinguishment. I on the other hand try to distinguish specifically who I'm talking about and to be even clearer those insults are not the crux of my arguments but simply personal catharsis. So don't conflate the two with each other please since many have tried to do so to misrepresent me in the past. Thirdly, once you are done with this video I think it's important you go back and watch the series from episode 1 onwards for two reasons. One to understand my intent with these videos but also to see how my argumentation has progressed as I myself was so misguided by the internet 
that I actually did not give the prequels enough credit in the earlier videos. But as the series has moved along, my research as well as the support from my community has expanded my knowledge on the events of the prequel trilogy both behind the scenes and in the films themselves, which has reflected in the quality of the videos. And finally, in regards to Cosmonaut himself, as a human being, I can't exactly comment on what I think of him, but assuming his content represents who he is as a person, I will tell you this, I think his videos have great production value, I think his editing is very good, as is his audio quality, which I will be the first to say is light years above my own, despite Cosmonaut having an extremely punchable voice. However, he is someone I really don't respect for anything other than his work ethic. People are going to say, how dare you attack him for having opinions. Let's get something straight. I'm not attacking him for his opinions. Opinions don't define good or bad. They define like and dislike. If he hates the prequels, that's perfectly fine. But if you're going to go on the internet and say that they suck, you're implying that they are of bad quality, which is an objective statement. And if you're going to pass off falsehoods, inaccuracies, misinformation, or just straight up lies as facts about the prequels and disguise it as your opinion, well that's when I tend to call the banners. Not to mention, opinions themselves can be objectively conflicting with one another. You can hate something for the same reason you love something else. This doesn't necessarily make you wrong, but it makes you inconsistent, and inconsistency lacks credibility. And if you amass any kind of following on the internet, especially the size of Cosmonaut's fanbase, then consistency is very important. However, sadly for his viewers, Cosmonaut doesn't seem to think so. And despite his massive following, Cosmonaut doesn't like to take responsibility for the stupid shit that comes out of his mouth on the internet. He doesn't care what he gets wrong, how inconsistent he is, or how he may insult others with his very provocative videos that he constructed with very poor argumentation, and he simply hides behind the it's my opinion, and he insists that objectivity does not exist. Because he knows that acknowledging it exists would fuck him straight in the ass. He thinks he can say whatever he wants, and that his amassed following will simply drown out the noise. Now, for any Cosmonaut fans watching this, note, this is not a personal attack on Cosmonaut. This is a very specific response series, and he is simply another name on the list. I didn't even plan on doing this, but this was probably my most requested video ever. So take that for what you will, but for the Cosmonaut fans who have already likely left their dislike and left as evident from another response video that was recently made on the man, and spelt out very clearly by the analytics of that video, the quality of the responding creator's content was irrelevant. All that apparently mattered to those people was if you dared to speak out at all. Then Cosmonaut's vast echo chamber of sheep will apparently come and attack you in droves. They basically bombarded him with insults and dislikes before even watching the video and moving right along. Now some will probably say, but Anomaly, does that not discourage you from making a video such as this? To which I say, on the contrary, I thrive on it. Which is why we are going to go ahead and kick the shit out of this hornet's nest anyway. So without further ado... Let's go school this motherfucker. Star Wars The Phantom Menace was the most disappointing thing since- Wow, four seconds. It took you four seconds, dipshit. Ah, here it is. Yep, let me, yep. Let's follow it down. Suck off Red Letter Media, check. Although it usually takes people longer. Cosmonaut, you might just be the world's fastest suck up. It's my son. Yes, before I start this breakdown, I have to address the big red letter in the room. No, you really don't. Cosmonaut, you could have an original thought in your body instead of feeding the circle jerk. Though I guess at this point I'd expect nothing less from you, so finish this up, let's be quick about it at least. The Mr. Plinkett reviews by Red Letter Media are probably the best analysis of the Star Wars prequels on the internet. And unfortunately for me, they are incredibly in-depth. <laughs> These movies have been around for a while, and there's almost nothing I can say that hasn't already been said by someone. So you're not even going to bother to try, is that it? You're just going to make the same shallow mistake everyone does and regurgitate the same shit? That's... that's pathetic, man, really. Not to mention that means we're going to be here for a fucking long time. But you guys have been demanding that I review these movies for years now, and I do have a lot to say. So I'm just going to go in with a clear mind and put the good old cosmonaut spin on things. Oh yeah, you do like to spin shit in these videos of yours, don't you? The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Because I do not like these movies. There's a shocker, given the red letter media dick sucking you exhibited in the first four seconds, I was expecting nothing but glowing admiration for these movies. I barely even like them ironically. These movies are not a guilty pleasure for me, because when I watch them I feel no pleasure, only guilt. Yeah, well sucks to be you. 
Like I said in the last video, you have to be brainwashed into liking these movies. Is that what I am, guys? Is that what I am to you? Am I a brainwasher? Do I wash your brains, everyone? Am I a brainwasher? No, 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 no. I am not a washer of brains. I am a liberator of them. I know this because I was brainwashed. They came out with these boring ass movies with a racist Jamaican caricature alien and they sold us toys and video games and Halloween costumes. And this was my whole childhood. New movie, new video games, new toys, Star Wars potato chips, Star Wars candy, Star Wars was everywhere. And it was glorious. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. And I liked Star Wars a lot, bro. I was watching Star Wars since before the prequels even came out. I've been in this fight since I was six years old. It truly fucking blows my mind that people are only just now mad at Star Wars for being a cash grab franchise that only cares about merchandise. Actually, a large number of people were, in your words, brainwashed into thinking that by the very agenda-driven ass clowns you decided to praise in the opening four seconds of this piece of shit video, one of their key shticks for fuck the prequels was that they were made as a product of greed solely for the purposes of selling toys in an effort to slander the creator. Did George Lucas merchandise his creation? Of course he did. He'd be an idiot not to. He didn't have a gun to anyone's head either. The question is, did George simply create two merchandise? And the answer is no for the most part, and certainly not at the expense of the story. Again, mostly. Admittedly, he would have included some characters or props, maybe a few costumes to help with the film's marketing, but the most famous example of him doing this is actually Return of the Jedi, not the prequels. While Star Wars was successful, George was not as of yet a made man with the franchise, and needed Episode 6 to turn a large profit. Having gone through family troubles, building a new house, taking out loans to fund Episode 5, when you look at the amount of costumes Leia possessed, the amount of bounty hunters in Jabba's palace that don't do jack shit, Luke's green lightsaber, and of course, the Ewoks, then yeah, George was striking while the iron was hot. And people, myself included, still love Return of the Jedi and lapped it up. Yet those same people want to push this argument against the prequels. That's very hypocritical, mate. However, despite all the marketing, George's movies had a vision and a clear story from episodes 1 to 6, Merchandising the brand doesn't change that, though it is very evident in recent years between merchandising your own product and exploiting a brand that you bought and paid for when you take note of how Star Wars has been handled as an IP in the hands of the original creator as opposed to a publicly traded soulless global entity like Disney who you suck off multiple times before the end of this 45 minute abortion. They seriously act like Disney's the only reason Star Wars is trying to make money? No, but again, that's the difference. George wanted to create and make money. Disney only wants to make money. What fucking planet have you been living on? Star Wars has always been like this. Star Wars Micro Machines. There's a cool adventure in every collection. New Star Wars Micro Machines. Machines so iconic, they're legendary. And when the prequel train started revving up, it was just time for more merchandise. It was a good time to be an impressionable little kid who loves Star Wars. And back then, I didn't have the mental capacity to judge these movies. That remains to be seen. Nobody in my age group did. We saw the lightsabers and we were on board. We didn't give a shit. I think everybody has that moment where they're watching the prequels after having grown up a bit and they realize, Jesus Christ, what did I like about these movies? Well, if they grow up and watch idiots on the internet like you, then maybe they will question their own taste in a product. Because news flash, but adults can be just as impressionable as kids if they think the idiot on the mic knows what the fuck they're talking about. You have almost a million subscribers, so I'll bet many newcomers mistake you as a smart person without actually thinking about what you have to say. I say this because guess what? I too was once a sheep that took the internet critics as gospel. I loved the prequels my whole life. I didn't think lesser of them until I started seeing red letter media wannabes trashing them without thinking about the stupid shit that was coming out of their mouths. But then again, I wasn't thinking about it either. It wasn't until I was tricked into liking another movie on my first viewing that I decided to start thinking for myself. I went back, watched the prequels, did my research, and voila, here I am torturing myself with your content. That moment where you realize that you don't actually understand the plot of any of these movies. <laughs> you know, it's a film for 12 year olds. That they're boring, and the acting is bad, and there's just no good aspect to enjoy. Once my generation got older, and we realized these movies were bad, there was peace on the internet. Are we, are we at peace? Peace, you call that peace? First of all, I'm around about the same age as you, 
So don't lump me in with that crowd. Our age does not mean we are affiliated. I have a brain, thanks. And secondly, what the fuck are you talking about? The quality of the prequels is a conversation that is very much ongoing. Matter of fact, it's because the Boba Fett pajama wearing OT fanatical hack jobs were older and quick to establish themselves on this platform. That's the reason the prequels received as much hate as they did for so long on the internet. It's only now that people like myself who actually watched the movies are having our two cents heard on the matter and outlining the years of stupidity directed against those films by morons like you. My only regret is that we didn't show up prior to October 30th, 2012. Maybe we could have prevented all this shit from happening. For a brief time, it was widely accepted that the Star Wars prequels were not good movies, and there wasn't anybody alive who unironically liked them. There was no more world hunger, racism was over, and we as a species had finally achieved world peace. Oh, we shall have peace. Once I'm done roasting you, Red Letter Media, and all the other idiots on the internet, we shall have peace. And then Disney started making Star Wars movies. This is a nightmare! Why are you lashing out against the fans? Why are you misrepresenting them? I can't fucking stand how people label Star Wars fans as a whole. Labeling them as this demographic of unbearable, whiny, unpleasable people? When I call out Star Wars fans, I try to make it clear which specific demographic I am calling out, so as not to use a minority as the crutch for a narrative I'm trying to sell. It's very clear which side of the fence you stand on when it comes to the new movies, as you're misrepresenting the actual fan reaction to the Disney purchase in order to further label the prequels as the real problem, not Disney. This is so dishonest of you. Now, admittedly, there was a portion of Star Wars fans that were very pessimistic about the purchase, but from what my research has gathered, those were mainly the hardcore Star Wars Expanded Universe fans, who were heavily invested in the books and the comics, which took place after Return of the Jedi. And they were afraid that Disney was going to screw with the canon and bastardize the stories that they had loved for so many years, which they were right about, by the way, since Disney's first move was to scrap the whole thing. But be that as it is, those people were still the minority of the reaction to the Disney purchase, and you fucking know it. Star Wars fans were ecstatic of the idea of more Star Wars films. They gave Disney a chance. A proper chance. So do I consider the fact that Disney now owns Lucasfilm a good thing? Not necessarily. I consider it a great thing. <laughs> but sadly for you, and for Disney, those fans possess a brain. Whereas you clearly do not. And they realize that the Disney films fucking sucked. Yeah, Disney's gonna do their own thing. It's gonna be awesome. We paved the way for them. We validated them. We, we, we gave them the green light. <laughs> I can't speak for everybody. I feel like I did though. Anyhow, George Lucas. I'm sorry. Let's watch my favorite part again, shall we? So do I consider the fact that Disney now owns Lucasfilm a good thing? Not necessarily. I consider it a great thing. Anyhow, George Lucas. I'm sorry. And now you're so butthurt by this uprising of fan outrage, and so butthurt that the majority don't agree with you, you're trying to villainize them. Fuck you. And now all of a sudden people are saying the prequels are good? What the fuck happened? Well, I guess people woke up. Maybe you should too. Not to mention, the imagery you're showing is you trying to paint the most extremes of the fandom in an attempt to make it look like these claims have no credibility to them. And I want to make this clear for everyone watching, because I know some tool is going to try and misrepresent me in the comments, or in another video somewhere, just because I point out the stupid shit people say about the prequels, does not mean I think the prequels are masterpieces by any stretch. And that goes for 99.99% .99 of the people, who know just how great those films are. I've seen so many people unironically defend these movies and then turn around and shit on other bad movies like Suicide Squad or Batman v Superman. You're goddamn right. Even though they all share the same exact issues. Okay, first off, fuck you. Secondly, the word you're looking for is consistency, something you sorely lack. Dude, 
you fall into that same category, grasping at straws to vilify the prequels whilst turning a blind eye to the mountains of horse shit in your precious Disney garbage. I really think people have been giving Rey a very bad rep for some pretty bad reasons. Most people just say they don't like her because she's too strong, but I don't know, it doesn't bother me. I personally don't really mind seeing a character who is good at things in Star Wars. All the other main characters in Star Wars are really good at stuff. Oh, how come Obi-Wan can defeat a Sith Lord all by himself when his master couldn't even do that? How come Luke is really good at using the Force without getting any training? Star Wars characters are really lucky and they're really good at shit because they're the main characters of a stupid action adventure series. Yet people only care that Rey is really good at shit and it drives me fucking crazy, man. Do you have any self-awareness? Overly expensive movies with bad effects and worse writing. You're a shit channel with shitty arguments and a shitty avatar. Do you see how little weight that carries unless you substantiate yourself? And way too many people are saying that the prequels are redeemed because they're better than the new movies. Now to be fair, some people do say that and I honestly hate it as much as you do but not for the same reasons. It's honestly a huge pet peeve of mine when people say the prequels are masterpieces compared to the new movies or the prequels are amazing thanks to Disney Star Wars. No, 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 no. The prequels have never been terrible. When put under a lens, a lot of the arguments against the prequels don't hold up which is the core reason why my series even exists. I firmly believe that after watching the Disney movies, that the majority of people who have changed their perspective have gone back to watch those movies with open eyes for a change and realized a large chunk of their gripes with the films weren't organically obtained, but rather influenced by someone else on the internet. And so they've grown a new adoration for the films, but in addition to that, the Disney films are showing the fans what actually bad writing characters and a lack of imagination looks like. Now first of all, the new movies aren't even that bad. <laughs> are you serious? What fucking world do you live in? I don't love every aspect of them, but I cannot call them bad movies. Okay... I honestly have full respect for people who hate the prequels and the sequels equally. I think that's totally fair. Well, as long as the argumentation isn't garbage, then yes, I can also respect that. What kills me is when people say these movies are good and these aren't. Oh, at least the prequels had some original ideas. Who the fuck says shit like this? Sane people. And second of all, don't fucking straw man us. That would be like me impersonating you saying you just don't like The Last Jedi because you don't understand the themes because we all know how those guys like to jerk off to those themes original ideas aren't enough to make a movie good nobody said it was but originality adds a layer of authenticity to the product which can help provide a more immersive and fulfilling experience to the audience so yes it's a huge positive positive. and something can still be good without having original ideas that's true as long as it has good writing and doesn't blatantly rip stuff off. Stranger Things doesn't have a single original idea at all and it's generally seen to be pretty good. Everybody likes it. The prequels have a lot of unique ideas, yeah, and they're not presented in a good way at all in these movies. I'm still waiting on your examples. Showing the pod race sequence certainly doesn't help your argument. The Jedi! What do you know? <laughs> If you thought this was going to be a video about me praising the prequels, then I'm sorry. You probably don't know me very well. Maybe we can be friends in another life. Dude, you made it very clear in the first four seconds exactly what kind of unoriginal shit stain you were. I can read you like a fucking book. As for the next life, well, I'll pass on your friendship in just about any life. Today I'm going to try and bring these movies back down a peg. Because I hate them and when people disagree with me I feel uncomfortable. Well no one said being in a minority was easy. Now before I start tearing into the movie I should be fair and talk about the good things. This isn't the worst movie ever made so it has to have some positive qualities, right? So uh... The music is pretty good. The thing is, almost every aspect of this movie that's sort of okay has a little asterisk right above it. I want to say the effects are good because a lot of them are technically very impressive. For a movie that came out in 1999, Jar Jar looks pretty good, but the effects aren't always integrated into the movie in a convincing way. Yeah, for special effects with test equipment prior to 1999, this movie looks phenomenal. I mean, the pod racing scene is pretty cool because it's the only time in the movie where you feel like you're not dead. 
Don't tempt me. I'm less than five minutes through this and I'm already staving off suicide. That's probably the only enjoyable scene other than the final battle. And I'd say the final battle is the one scene that is so cool it tricked people into liking this movie for just a little bit after it came out. Except for the countless people who still love it to this day, jackass. Saying it tricked people is suggesting you can't like it organically, which is horse shit. Sometimes an exciting ending can fool an audience into thinking a movie is good, and this final battle is actually pretty dope. But at the same time, it's kind of hard to enjoy it when you realize that you don't care about any of the things that are happening in this movie. True, because in order for you to care, you actually have to watch the movie. There is also one single line that I kind of like in this movie. Perhaps I killed a Jedi and took it from him. I don't think so. No one can kill a Jedi. I wish that were so. I kind of like the subtle foreshadowing in that line. Yeah, it's great. George Lucas loves the foreshadow. It's a well-known staple of his style, by the way. And that's one of the only times I'm ever going to call these movies subtle, so enjoy it. But the main positive in this movie is definitely the music. The John Williams score is always the one aspect of these movies that is on point. I want to believe that old Johnny saw these movies and was like, okay, I gotta try to fix these as best as I can. But it is kind of unintentionally funny sometimes because you'll be visually looking at nothing happening in these movies, but the music will be popping the fuck off. Don't misrepresent those scenes, they were both intercut with a raging battle going on, not to mention both scenes were a race against time, Queen Amidala to find the Viceroy and Anakin to halt the possible murder of Palpatine. But that's all I can say in the way of praise. These movies honestly fail at almost every level of filmmaking. I can't be the only one who hates it when people on the internet use the term filmmaking in that condescending tone, like they just finished a for dummies book and are oh so very proud of themselves. So we are going to watch this movie with the same framework that we watched A New Hope in. For the first time, I'm going to try to watch this movie with my fully evolved film brain. I'm going to pretend as if I have never seen this movie before. Anybody else's bullshit detector just go off? And right off the bat, the opening title crawl is just too much. Remember when I talked about how perfect the title crawl is in A New Hope? It's simple, effective, and it doesn't throw too much information at us. Yeah, because it was a very simple story during a time of war, not a time of peace, where empires and death stars weren't the eye-catching centerpieces for the story. Revenge of the Sith took place in a time of war, and had a very simple title crawl as well. Clone Wars Rage, Palpatine kidnapped, Jedi sent to save the day, boom. But with all that said, the opening crawl is meant to be exposition heavy. It's essentially the filmmaker's free pass to give the audience information. Look no further than the Vegas Hell title crawl for The Rise of Skywalker to show how you can completely fuck this up. This is the first paragraph in the Phantom Menace title crawl. Turmoil has engulfed the Galactic Republic. The taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems is in dispute. This is the first indication of the tone of the movie. It's fucking boring. Okay, checklist time. Politics. Boring. Tick. There are no signs of life in this movie at all. So just because the movie started itself in a time of peace, that's boring by default. It's no wonder the Disney movies were afraid of losing the audience's attention in five minutes because of the zero attention span morons like you. Performances are stiff, the lines are dry and lifeless, and the movie isn't even directed in an engaging way. What? People are having conversations. Would you want a bird's eye view or something? As for the lines, well, that depends on what you are referring to specifically. I can't exactly counter-argue if you don't give an example. Everybody kind of talks the same, and it's really awkward. Like, who the fuck talks like this? This is incredible. We recommend a commission be sent to Naboo to ascertain the truth. The Congress of Malastair concurs with the Honorable Delegate from the Trade Federation. They're alien politicians, you imbecile. Of course they don't sound like two homies smoking a joint. When you start the movie, you might think that the Jedi just talk in this weird, overly wordy way because they're like warrior monks. I kind of accept the fact that they talk weird. Well, I'm glad you have some common sense. Yes, the Jedi were meant to be calm and stoic in the film because they are meant to be calm and emotionless, content and unambitious. That is a key plot point for the movie, by the way. So that's why you don't hear fluctuations in their tone, but despite their best efforts, they can feel emotion. They aren't machines. 
But everybody fucking talks like this, except the Jamaican and the literal child. What weird way are you talking about? And yet, Jar Jar's an alien amphibian and Jake Lloyd was a kid in these movies. So what? And while they may sound different, their line delivery is on another fucking level. You mean I get to come with you and your starship? What the fuck's wrong with that? Dude's not even 10 years old and he's playing a child under George Lucas's direction. He's just been freed from slavery and gets to go on a space adventure. Good for him. See, George has this weird problem where his dialogue is kind of the worst thing about his movies. I'm not lying, man. Even in the original Star Wars, the instant classic, his actors constantly made fun of him for his dialogue. And then I started reading, and it seemed to me the dialogue was pretty ropey. It's a true story. Harrison Ford, who plays the space pirate in the film, at one point threatened to tie George up and, and uh, make him say his own lines at gunpoint. <laughs> Checklist time. Use outside footage with barely any context to discredit George Lucas. Tick. And oh, wait, there's another point. Prequels have garbage dialogue without distinguishing the point whatsoever. Tick. Two boxes. Nice work. But back then, he had a team to help him fix up the script and make it sound like lines that real people would say. The original movies were only good because of people other than George. Tick. Star Wars should be simple. We just saw Han Solo talking like a regular fucking guy, and now all the characters talk like weird Shakespeare robots. Whoa, whoa, hold up, rewind. What the fuck did you just say? Star Wars should be simple. We just saw Han Solo talking like a... Star Wars should be simple. Star Wars should be simple. Star Wars should be simple. Go fuck yourself. Here's something you and the entitled, fanatical, internet fucktards need to understand. Star Wars, or more specifically George Lucas's Star Wars, does not cater to your specific needs. It is an IP that belongs to someone else. It is their story, not yours. You don't get to dictate what Star Wars should and should not be. George Lucas is the author. You are the reader. You can't tell a creator how to create their own creation. Obviously, you can offer helpful criticism. There's nothing wrong with that. But I draw the line at idiots like you saying what Star Wars should and should not be. Now, by all means, you can use that line with the corporate dipshits at Disney because they bought the IP from someone else. They did not create what they own, nor do they understand it. So criticize whatever you like, in whatever way you wish, when it's Disney, not George. And in addition to that, Disney is a clear-cut example of how the creative process can be fucked with by letting outside meta and fan demands dictate a story in one way or another instead of allowing the story to grow organically and authentically as part of a singular creative vision. And that's a word that I've heard people use to describe this dialogue. Shakespearean. Okay, I will concede that Shakespeare's works had an influence on George Lucas and gave him some inspiration for the prequels, but this really only tends to make its presence known for the romance in Attack of the Clones, a film that Lucas himself has said is a romance at its core. Now that's a different conversation entirely. As for the rest of the dialogue in the prequels, a lot of it deals with politics and philosophy. The dialogue itself isn't given by thugs from the OT like Han Solo or Lando Calrissian. So don't classify the dialogue as a whole for all three movies as Shakespearean due to partial influence. The more appropriate term would be formal dialogue. When you see the Jedi talk to one another, you're seeing one wise man addressing another. Or you're seeing the Jedi address his Padawan learner. When you see Chancellor Palpatine addressing the Jedi or Queen Amidala in the political realm, they are discussing topics of galactic importance where they need to be clear and concise. When Queen Amidala, the highest person of authority on her planet of Naboo, addresses her people, she talks in a stoic, formal manner because she, for lack of a better term, has an obligation to as their leader. Anakin Skywalker as a kid and Luke Skywalker, the farm boy, don't talk in a Shakespearean manner, nor do they talk in a formal manner. They are young individuals that had a non-formal upbringing, at least until Anakin was inducted into the Jedi. Jar Jar Binks certainly doesn't speak formally, or Shakespearean, and Watto is a greedy lowlife junk trader who doesn't speak in this Shakespearean formal manner either. Captain Panaka, the Queen's bodyguard, also didn't use this overly formal dialogue. He was formal when he was addressing the Queen, but he spoke plainly to the Jedi because he didn't answer to them. Not to mention he always added that little extra layer of spice to his scenes. This is a dangerous situation, Your Highness. Our security volunteers will be no match against the battle-hardened Federation Army. If we can't get the shield generator fixed, we'll be sitting ducks. More likely, they were wiped out. 
but that's honestly using the word wrong in my opinion. I've always seen a work as Shakespearean when we talk about how the actions of the characters dictate their emotions. It's less about what they say and more about how they feel. It's not just Shakespearean because they talk funny. And neither is the prequels. There's a reason why characters talk the way they talk. It's annoying and it makes it impossible to connect to the characters. And who decided that, you? Because me and millions of other people connected to the character just fine. Also, for someone who's labeling this video as his opinion, you're using a lot of absolutes, like impossible for people to do this, or impossible for people to do that, when you do not speak for everybody. And this manner of speech makes it so that we never really know who these characters are on a deeper level, because none of these characters have character traits. Oh geez, that sounds familiar. I want you to tell me who the main character of the Phantom Menace was. I've gone through this in the earlier episode of this series, so let's just move on for the moment. They also never talk about how they feel, and all of the dialogue is just to tell us what is literally happening in the story. Okay, so just because the story doesn't stop in its tracks so that the characters can monologue about how they feel, that makes the characters unrelatable and without character traits? Okay, first of all, why would they talk about how they feel unless the situation demands it? Secondly, Characters don't have to explicitly talk about how they feel in order for the audience to discern how they feel by watching them. You are thinking, you said people are gonna die? I don't know. Gungans get pasted too, eh? I hope not. We said got a grand army. That's why you're not liking us, Mr. Dinks. Thirdly, in The Phantom Menace, the two characters of interest and George Lucas has said as much are Anakin and Padme. And on multiple occasions, the story quiets down to explore both of these characters. The movie explores them both individually and in their own dynamic with one another. We felt joy with Anakin upon his triumph at the pod race. We felt the sadness when he left with Qui-Gon to pursue a greater destiny for himself but having to leave his mother behind. We feel Padme's distress in the Senate meetings, her desperation to resolve the conflict on her planet as soon as possible for fear of her people's lives. And in space, we become endeared to both characters as she tends to Anakin's inability to handle the cold of space and Anakin's childlike sweetness handing her a token of his affection with the Japor snippet. As for Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, they are playing the role of C-3PO and R2-D2 from A New Hope, which you yourself have said is your personal favorite Star Wars movie. So you may not know this, but A New Hope shares a very similar structure as The Phantom Menace by design as George Lucas's intention. The Jedi are emotionless as part of their code, explored in this very movie by the way, but at the same time they are the driving force for the events taking place and they are a vessel for the audience to observe what's going on. They are the main characters for sure, Qui-Gon more so than Obi-Wan, but the important story beats don't actually involve them as characters. The important shit is regarding Anakin and Queen Padme Amidala. Now with that said, they do have character traits. Qui-Gon has a stern mentor's nature about him, but also compassion for others as well as a sense of humor and mischievous nature to him regarding his use of the force. Not to mention how he's disgruntled by his code and chooses to approach the universe through moral grays. Do not defy the council master, not again. I shall do what I must, Obi-Wan. If you would just follow the code, you would be on the council. Obi-Wan, on the other hand, is his headstrong but devoted apprentice with a sense of humor of his own. You were right about one thing, master. The negotiations were short. Why do I sense we've picked up another pathetic life form? He's a very by-the-books character, questioning even his own master and friend when he defies the council, out of what is possible jealousy for Anakin. Do these really sound like characters who don't express how they feel or exhibit any character traits? Are these characters we can't relate to on a deeper level? Yeah, I didn't think so. Nice try though, Cozzy. Take all the dialogue scenes in this movie and think about what their purpose is in the story. Oh, this ought to be good. Two characters explaining where they are and what they're doing. Characters coming up with a plan. Characters coming up with a plan. Characters coming up with a plan and meeting someone new. A New Hope did the same thing this early on in the movie. Though, reminder, it was significantly slower than The Phantom Menace, FYI. Also, yes, the movie needs to establish itself and the new characters in the opening. So what? And another thing. There are some people who only seem to reference the pod race and the final battle as the high points of action throughout The Phantom Menace. Do you forget that Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were trying to escape the Trade Federation forces in the opening of the movie? 
They don't exactly have time to stop and smell the roses. Characters making a deal and coming up with a plan. Characters talking about the plot and what's happening. Characters coming up with a plan. Characters coming up with a plan. Inappropriate flirting. You're a funny little boy. See, this is why I explained the characters and dialogue before you went on your little tangent. So we can all laugh at what an absolute fucking idiot you are. Or worse, you know you're being dishonest about the film and are making a conscious effort to misrepresent it to the audience. Characters coming up with a plan. Do you see the fucking problem here? There are very few scenes of our characters being normal people and expressing emotions in this movie. Oh, we see the problem, alright. But it ain't with the movie, just the movie critic. With a very clear agenda. And again, emotion should only be expressed when the situation calls for it. Or when the characters have time to breathe and reflect as I outlined before. You say the characters need to express more emotions or have more emotional scenes? Could you be specific? Because if you think fabricating emotion out of thin air would be a good answer for what your grievances are, it wouldn't. Because that would be cheap, manipulative bullshit designed to trick the audience and it wouldn't feel authentic. Nor would it feel earned. And with all that said, I think we will leave it here. That was part one of this Revenge of the Prequels episode. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget there's currently nine other episodes of this series so if you're going to watch them the best way to do so is from the start with episode one and work your way down the list before i go i want to give a shout out and thank you to all of my patrons you guys are amazing and i appreciate your support very much if you'd like to support the channel with a monthly donation even if it's just a dollar per month the link to patreon will be in the description below also i'd like to thank my youtube members as well thank you all the star killers the captain prices and the master chiefs for your support i appreciate it the link to memberships is also in the description. If you'd like to contact me, you can reach out to me on Twitter, or preferably you can contact me on the channel's Discord server. What Discord is, is basically an online community where other followers of this channel congregate to talk about a range of different topics, from Star Wars to video games, anime, and so on. So I hope to see you on there, chances are you'll make some friends along the way. Now with all that said, here's one more thank you for staying to the end of the video. You are a legend, and I'll see you next time. The main thing is to protect these characters. Make sure that they still continue to, to live in the way that you created them. I sold them to the white slavers. Star Wars The Phantom Menace was the most disappointing thing since... Share your energy with me! Great.